Thank you, Glenda. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. I didn't know you were gonna throw me a emotional prelude. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to our worship service at the Hampton United Methodist Church. All of you here, as well as our friends listening on KLMJ Radio and others joining us on Facebook. I'm Kathy Atkinson. I'll be serving as your worship leader this morning, and Kate Hinden will be your song leader. You're all invited to a time of fellowship downstairs following the service, and I understand we'll be celebrating Don Springer's birthday. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Please join me in our call to worship. Family of God, as we gather today, Jesus asks us, who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, the, the Son, Son of, of the, the living God. God. Family of God, as we gather today, the Holy Spirit asks us, who do you say that I am? You, you are, are our comforter, comforter advocate, advocate, and sustainer. Family of God, as we gather today, God the Father asks us, who do you say that I am? You are our creator, provider, and healer. Family of God, as we gather today, the triune God asks us, who do you say that I am? You are love that creates, saves, and enfolds us into the family of God. May we be instruments of love in all that we are and all that we do. Amen. Please join me for hymn number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. seated. Our epistle lesson from the epistle of Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. I appeal to you therefore brothers and sisters by the mercy of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, 
what is good, acceptable, and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now please join me for number 467, Trust and Obey. This morning, we're happy to have Stephanie Kletzer sing for us. was lost but now I'm found I once was lost but now I'm found so far away but I'm home now I once was lost but now I'm found 
song sees. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know how, but when he touched me, I once was blind, but now I see. And now my life song sings. And now my life song sings. And now my life song sings. I once was dead. Let us all join together in our prayer of confession. We look for you in all the wrong places, God of love, and wonder why we cannot find you. We wander through the corridors of power while you are on the sidewalks beside the homeless. We sit at the head tables of the world while you are handing out soup to the hungry at the kitchen's back door. We applaud those who win the race while you are cheering on those in last place. In forgiving us, you would transform our cold hearts into those melted in service to others. In granting us mercy, you challenge us to think of all those we have ignored in gifting us with grace, you enable us to proclaim Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as the hope, the joy, the peace the world seeks. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? 
Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. Well, good morning. We enter his gates with singing. What a wonderful start for our service, a beautiful music. Throughout all of history, as God has sought to get our attention, it has been this, this challenge as to who we listen to and what is the message that we are hearing. I like the way that our epistle to the Romans brings it home for us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. For this is your spiritual worship. I have taken classes on worship, what worship is, what worship does, how to do worship, how not to do worship, and yet, this scripture verse seems to say it better than any other. We don't need to learn about worship. We need to worship. This is our spiritual task. And it seems as if it has been true from all of history all the way back to the Garden of Eden when God was walking through the garden with Adam and Eve, yelling, where are you? Where are you? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the minds. Is that where we're at? Are we being transformed? Can we discern the will of God for us? This has been our challenge as we grow up in the world, but hopefully not of the world. As we learn, as we experience, but as we remember that we are God's children. And I think Paul, I think Abraham, I think Moses, and all the prophets, and all the preachers, and disciples, and apostles, and brothers and sisters, we need to each remember this, that God had a plan from the very beginning to send His Son to die on a cross so that we could be reacquainted with Him. So that when He calls to us saying, where are you? We could say, right here. Right here this morning in worship as we worship You. Lord God, let us know that You are here with us. Amen. Our call to confession, it said that we're looking for God in all the wrong places. Uh, the question is, are we looking for God? Are we looking for God? And what do we see when we find God? 
I was on the computer this week and, and I saw um, you know, on Google that they're looking for the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, and they have pictures. Uh, it seems like every year somebody gets their camera out and takes pictures. Um, but have they found? See, that's the question for us today is, have we found God? In the context of our gospel lesson, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, come away with me uh, into the district of Caesarea Philippi. And there he asks them, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Now, um, theology um, now kind of doesn't get to the Son of Man, that phraseology, it is a term. Um, the commentaries like to play with it, but to, to get us home with that term, he's asking who is the Son of Man, which to them meant something. To us, we look at Jesus after the resurrection, and we understand that Jesus is our Savior. We understand Jesus is our Messiah. To them, their understanding of Messiah is one who lives forever, one who never dies. And so it's, it's kind of harder for Jesus, as we look at his lessons and his teachings, it's kind of harder for us to see that he says that he's the Messiah because he doesn't want them to think that he's not going to die. Because you'll see very soon as he's talking to the disciples, he tells the disciples that I am going to die. And so Jesus kind of embraces this son of man. He embraces it, but he embraces it in a way that if you were in their culture and if you knew something about their phraseology, then you might have a clue in understanding why he embraces the Son of Man. But Jesus starts out, well, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples said, well, the people would say that you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist being as a preparer for the Messiah. Not the Messiah, but the preparer of the Messiah. So some people are looking at Jesus in that time, in that culture, and saying, this is not the Messiah, but he is preparing us for the Messiah. So what he's telling us is all good. And we hope and pray that the Messiah someday will come. But others said Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or some other prophets, and Elijah, there's prophecy in the Old Testament that says the Elijah will come back before the Messiah. The Elijah will be the reformer. We reform the hearts of the people for the Messiah to come so that when the Messiah comes, he will come in all triumph and glory and everybody who sees him will praise him. But... In the prophecies of the Messiah from the Old Testament, it says that the Messiah will never die. Messiah will be an everlasting Messiah. Eternal life is His. And Jesus was not really embracing that thought or definition of Messiah. And then he turned to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah. Do any of you know someone who has practiced for a race in high school or college or maybe the Olympics? 
They're on a team or an individual, and they are practicing, they are training, they're trying to be the best they can be so that they can run the race and finish the race and then become that gold medal winner, become the hero, become. But you never refer to them as a gold medal winner until the end of the race. The end of the race. And so when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Jesus is hoping that Peter would say, you are the son of man. Because in prophecy, the Son of Man is one who is born and lives and dies and is resurrected. The Messiah is one who has eternally been alive forever and will never die. Says who? Sometimes we take the word of the Lord and we keep adding to it and adding to it and, and we add to it things that are symbolic and things that are, well, Lord, open our eyes so that we can see and understand what prophecy is and what prophecy means. End time prophecy. Uh, how many of you people know which books of the Bible talk about end time prophecy the most? Not, not little snippets, but the most. Anybody want to venture a guess? Y'all said Revelation. Okay, let's, you're, you're so New Testament. You're so New Testament. Uh, anybody uh, want to take a stab at Old Testament? Old Testament, what book of the Old Testament talks about end time theology? Daniel? Daniel. Daniel. And so let's look at Daniel chapter 7. I was watching in the night visions this dream, this vision. And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came unto the Ancient of Days, God. And they brought him near before him, and then to him the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. For indeed, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is the one kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And you see, it is that as we hear that Daniel prophecy, as we hear this Peter's great confession that you are the Messiah, our understanding of Messiah has kind of belittled this Son of Man thing because we know Jesus not as that itinerant preacher that was wandering around for three years healing and doing miracles. We see him as the Son of God who died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And so our theology is wrapped around Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah instead of Son of Man. But you know, this understanding of Peter kind of caught Jesus by surprise because Jesus didn't know that the Father told Peter. How else would he know? Thou art the Messiah. 
I haven't done that yet. I haven't died on the cross. I haven't saved you from your sins. I am not the Messiah until I complete the mission. But the Father, who is and knows all things, from the time very beginning to the time very far in the future, He knows that I've died for your sins. He knows that I've saved you. He knows that I am the Messiah. And the only way that you could know that, Peter, is if He told you so. What has the Lord told you? What has the Lord told you? We sing the hymns as if they're talking to us. We sing, He walks with us, He talks with us. Who do you say the Son of Man is? Jesus answered him, saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And I tell you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, the rock. Uh, we are so New Testament. If you would study the Old Testament, and if you would look up in your dictionary or if you look up the word rock, you would stumble across a scripture verse that talks about Abraham and Sarah. You would see in that verse this idea that we are supposed to remember where we come from. Old Testament theology, look back to Abraham and Sarah. Look back to the rock from which you were hewn. And so, is Peter the rock? Or is Abraham the rock? Or is Jesus, rock of ages, cleft for me? And for you, we can look at the, the words and the names, uh, proper names in the Hebrew culture and language quite often meant something. Peter does mean rock. Um, if you look at the Arabic or, or the Hebrew uh, specifically, uh, you can go into Petrus or you, you can look at um, one of his other names uh, in Greek. Uh, and see what each one of those names, one of those uh, per time, uh, because language changes, uh, actually meant rock, and at another time, uh, an earlier, kind of like an archaic word, would have meant a small rock or a pebble, a fragment of the whole. A fragment of the whole. And so, since we're not linguistics, uh, we're not in that study, we're not really going to argue about that other than to understand that whether we give thanks to Peter or to Abraham for what we've learned and know, our thanks really go to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, for they are the ones, they are the ones, for the words of the prophets, the words of preachers, all who declare, this is the word of the Lord. From the Old Testament, listen to me, all you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. 
Look to Abraham, the father of faith, and Sarah, his wife. They have given you birth. You are alive. Look now to the Son of God who comes and tells you new birth. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Look to Him who says, even to the disciples, even to the world, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monsters, so will the Son of Man, the Son of Man, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus died, and he was buried, and three days later, the Son of Man arose from the dead. He arose from the dead. The question is, what would have happened? What was our sermon title? If they had known who He was, would they have crucified our Savior? God has a plan, a plan of salvation. And there is an evil spirit through the world. Some would call him Satan, the Antichrist, whatever. And they also have a plan. Their plan was not that Jesus hang on a cross. Their plan was not that we be forgiven of our sins. Their plan was not that any of us would seek the Lord and be saved. But by the glory of God's will and plan, we are when we confess Jesus as our Lord, Savior, and Messiah. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We speak a message of wisdom among the mature, Not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are all coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory even before time began. None of the rulers of this age, he is writing in the same century, the death of Christ occurred. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, These are the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And all God's children said, Amen. Humble your sight yourselves in the sight of the Lord and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who give us against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Time flies. Look at that. (laughs) Please join me for hymn number 382, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
Let us join together in our offertory prayer. Loving and generous God, as we offer our gifts this day, we confess that when confronted with Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Our answer is questionable. Even when we get the words right, we know our thoughts and lives give a different answer. We turn away from the suffering and oppression of your children. We accumulate wealth and prestige and ignore the poor and powerless. You give and hold nothing back. We give from our excess and resent being asked to do more. Help us to respond with the answer that comes from the assurance you hear us when we pray. And all God's children said amen. The pastor's got three different programs running through his mind as he does the third service today, so forgive me for getting ahead of myself. Peter was the rock, and the question I have is, does that make us Jewish? Peter was Jewish. He was born Jewish. He died Jewish. They say that Peter was the head of the Catholic Church. Does that make us Catholic? There were also 12 other disciples, minus one and then plus one, 12 other disciples. And to them, the message, the call of God went upon them as well after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus said to them, as God has sent me, I send you. And so does it really matter who Peter was? Or does it matter more who we are? Can we be the rock upon which the church is built? Can we be part of God's kingdom? Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, if you suffer as a Christian, as a Christian, not as a Jew, not as a Gentile, not as a man, not as a woman, but as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Christians, family of God. Go from this place led by the triune God who loves you, saves you, and sustains you that in our following Him we may be agents of goodness and blessing wherever we go. And all God's children, Christians, say, Amen. Please join me for our closing hymn 545, The Church is One Foundation. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. The church is one. 